welcome back out to the channel. My name's Kim. I'm a licensed and practicing Chinese medical provider and a Taoist practitioner. And today I wanted to talk to you about something that's been bothering me. I'm wondering, could we have a hand in engineering the next pandemic? You know, what are the unintended consequences of our actions? And I'm going to tell you, what got me started on this was a study that was published as a preprint at the end of May 2023. So just a few months ago, that study clear as day said that one of the reasons why this disease is changing so quickly is because of the pressure from humoral immunity. So what does that mean? It's changing because we're pressuring it with our antibody treatments. That kind of caught me by surprise. So I've spent the last couple months kind of researching this, trying to come to some sort of conclusion. I want to share that information with you. I first published this information in my members only area, oh, about a month or so ago. Are we creating another pandemic? Are we setting up a situation where we're pressuring this virus into another pandemic? Who knows? You ready to get started? Let's go. I ran across this scientific paper on our immune system and what was happening with our immune system. This was the first paper that really got me thinking about this because if you download this study and you go past the abstract, the very first sentence in the introduction clearly says this virus is mutating because we are putting so much pressure on it with our antibody treatments. Humoral immunity, that's the immune system in our blood, that's antibodies. So the, the hypothesis then becomes, okay, every time that we push a new treatment out, that would encourage this virus to change. Hello. Hello, darling. Claire? Yes, darling. I thought you weren't going to be able to make it for this episode. No, I'm available. Okay, okay. Where Where are you? I'm in Geneva, what, Switzerland. What are you doing in Geneva? Well, I'm going to meet Mr. Farrar. Jeremy Farrar, the head of Welcome who took that job with the World Health Organization, the one who was instrumental in delivering the paper, The Proximal Origin of COVID, that Jeremy Farrar? Well, yes. What in the world are you, why are you trying to meet Jeremy Farrar? Well, you must not have seen his layout in the Financial Times where he stretched himself out so inviting. Just like a little pussy cat. Come to mama, little kitty kitty. Meow, meow. Thank you so much for that visual. That is permanently seared into my frontal lobe. Come to mama, kitty kitty kitty. Okay, okay, okay. Let me get this on hands free. Can you hear me? Definitely, Kim. Awesome. Okay, we're good to go. Claire, the original research, which even got me to start thinking about, are we bioengineering the next pandemic? It identified a number of studies which indicate that those monoclonal antibody treatments that we're using for COVID-19 are actually pushing the virus to change. My question to you is, the mRNA inoculations that we're using, those also create antibodies in our system. And could those antibodies also be pushing this virus to change? It's unfortunate, but there doesn't seem to be any research to address that. It is, are the antibodies from the inoculations also pushing the virus to change? 
So if I understand you correctly, there isn't really a lot of research out there that is trying to address that question. Are these really unique inoculations which we're giving the public, could they also be encouraging this virus to change? Are they putting enough pressure on this virus that it is going to try and change? One of the things that we could probably do then is watch as we create new boosters, do we suddenly see more, more changes in the virus coming in at that time? I think that's interesting. I think you're right because we're not doing any research on this. So the only way that we can look at this is in real life, right? Unfortunately, it's not usually, it's not the most optimum way to check things out, but right now that looks like the only option that we have. So we're going to have to watch as each new booster, each new inoculation comes out and see what happens to the variants. I, I'm with you. I, I don't really see another option if we're not going to take this back to the lab and study it. Talking about the influenza virus and how quickly does that mutate? When we look at the influenza virus, there's a small section that can change within three to five years, and then everything else takes a long time. It's quite different from COVID-19. So the slowest mutation has been longer than 40 years. And the quickest mutation could be three to five years. And so this thing doesn't mutate that quickly. It doesn't require us to update vaccines too often. That is true. That's really different than what we're seeing with the coronavirus and, or at least COVID-19. And that is why we've been hearing a lot of scientists say that you cannot create these inoculations in time for how quickly this is mutating. Is that, is that a true statement? Yes, I think that concern started maybe in 2021 where the scientists were already starting to identify that the COVID-19 was changing so rapidly that to think that we could stay up to date with the vaccines or the inoculations was improbable to say the least. They can't change the boosters as fast as this thing changes, as fast as COVID-19 changes. Kim, let me share this research report with you. Now, when I first looked at this report, it was a preprint. Now it's published and it's looking at the effectiveness of that new bivalent booster. Now the bivalent, remember that's different than the one that we've been taking. The bivalent, instead of just having one type of COVID-19 in it, it has the spike protein from two different types of COVID-19 in it. So that was officially approved by the FDA in May of 2023, we actually had started delivering it about six months earlier. And here's the interesting thing about this research. It indicated that when they first gave this booster, it was 29% effective. The bad news is, is within four to five months, it had already dropped to 20% effective. And then you go after the fifth month and it's suddenly down to 4% effective. That's the problem. The COVID-19, it's changing so rapidly that these boosters become obsolete very quickly. I think that we're facing something else right now. We're facing a vaccine fatigue. It's, we're going to, if we're going to try and even stay up with this, we're going to be vaccinating almost on a monthly basis. And it used to be the flu shot was once a year. Well, this is already three times a year or more. I don't know. I think that everybody is coming up with vaccine fatigue and that there's not a willingness. There's going to become a much smaller willingness to take another vaccine because they don't seem to be working. I saw your shorts that you've been publishing on the uh, hospitalizations and it's it's amazing but the hospitalizations the m majority of them appear to be vaccinated with that booster that's not quite what we were looking for 
really difficult to make a decision on what's happening here. You know, I have another question. We've actually have history of what happens when we pressure a bacteria, a virus, when we pressure a living organism and we pressure them uh, to die. And what what were some of the different areas in that that you found were interesting? Well, you know, Kim, I think we do have a lot of experience with pressuring things. And probably our very first experience was with antibiotics and that level of pressure creating MRSA here in the United States. And I forget what it created um, over in India, but we were able to pressure bacteria to the point that it became very virulent and very difficult to treat. And now if you get infected with that, you have it for life. And you have to tell your doctor that you have this because it is so incredibly, I guess you would say, contagious also. Now, there's another one that we have, and this one doesn't get a lot of press. I I imagine it will start getting more press, but it comes from GMO. GMO foods, where we have pressured weeds with glyphosate. So we have pressured them to die with glyphosate. And similar to antibiotics, about 20 years to make a very virulent strain. Well, it took about 20 years to make a very virulent weed, and they call it pigweed. The problem with pigweed is if that gets in your field, it's almost impossible to take care of it. And it can take over your field in a week. And if you think about that, some of these fields are like 500 acres large and suddenly you have pigweed just like a mad army coming to consume your field. It's very scary. Now, I think you actually did a report on GMOs and how this was in, impacting our yields because our yields, they are saying, are actually below the yields that we had before we went with GMOs. So the promise of these high yields that could last forever, it's just, they're, they're, it's not there. But um, yeah, I think you should put a link to your episode on the GMOs, because there's another perfect example of how when we pressure something to die, like Dr. Ion Malcolm said, life will find a way. That is an interesting one, because they don't talk that much about the pressure that glyphosate put on crops and put on weeds. And they don't talk about how that glyphosate, how Roundup ended up encouraging these weeds to grow into these toxic waste dumps. We have the history. We know that when we pressure life, it finds a way and it finds a way in ways that don't help us, that actually really harm us. And so here we have this new virus and we have these new ways of treating it and and we don't really know what any of this stuff does. So I think as we go forward, this is going to be a very interesting time. If we're pushing, if if they're already seeing that our antibodies are pushing this virus to change, there's a risk there. There's a potential risk there. Yes, it sure, sure would be nice if I didn't have to feel like a science experiment, right? So Claire, are you going to be staying in Geneva? Yes, I am going to stay in Geneva. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to find another hotel because I was kicked out of the hotel that I was in. (laughs) You what? You got kicked out of the hotel. Wow. Imagine that. Who could imagine that? You're stalking some poor defenseless kitten. Yes, well, I, I had found Mr. Farrar and... Unfortunately, the hotel security said that I was stalking him. Of all things, me stalking him. Well, you know, you go have some coffee and maybe a couple pastries, and maybe you you can bump into him on the road. And really, that little kitten, he needs to come to mama. 
Claire, thank you for stopping by. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Hashtag Half Truce, where we're trying to just figure out what could be happening and how are we going to address our health as we're going forward? Because surprise, you're going to have to take more ownership of your health.